Pure faded. Thank you. Just 15 k's from Sydney is Dragon Territory. Jump in and you'll find these strange and beautiful creatures living amongst the seaweed. Weedy sea dragons are native to Australia and can be found in the waters mostly off the south and east coasts. They're related to seahorses and often just drift about in the water, blending in with the kelp around them. The problem is these colourful creatures are becoming harder and harder to spot, and not just because of their clever camouflage. This is the best site in Sydney, so you can still see them here reliably. Other sites, particularly on the north side of Sydney, where they used to be a common occurrence, now you're lucky to find one and, and sometimes you find none. Luckily, marine biologists have a plan to work out just how many weedies are left. Instead of catching and tagging every sea dragon they find, they're asking citizen scientists divers off the coasts of New South Wales, Victoria and Tasmania to take photos of the creatures and send them in. The researchers are then using a kind of facial recognition software to identify each fish's unique patterns. The software program allows us to um, map out uh, the markings on the side of a weedy sea dragon and it becomes a unique fingerprint for the weedies. Every time they identify a new weedy, they give it a very appropriate name to help keep track of it. And it will tell us if it's David or Greg or Alicia, because every single new sea dragon we have gets a name, so we can follow it over the years. Weedy sea dragons are classified as near threatened, but scientists reckon this research could provide enough info to have them relisted as endangered. They reckon climate change could be a big part of the problem for the sea dragons. They say rising sea temperatures are killing the kelp, which leaves them homeless. Once they're gone, they're gone. Once we lose them, we will never get them back. They were here many, many thousands, hundreds of thousands of years ago. With our impact, losing them would be really sad. They're asking divers to keep sending in their photos so they can make sure there are more little Davids, Gregs or Alicias swimming around Australia in the future. Hello, everybody. Um, sorry for the scuffed start. Um, I... 
I messed that up. <laughs> I messed up the transition with the video. I went to my normal, um, my normal display capture, and then the, and then autoplay was on, so it started playing some random song that's happened before. But here we are. Um, you didn't get to see the intro video. We're here. We're ready. We did the test call. The title's there. The beautiful graphic was here. Thank you, William, for making this. It took a really long time. <laughs> to do that, so I appreciate it. Um, today, we are talking to Sam Allen, um, who is a master's student with uh, the University of Technology, Sydney. Thank you for the nine months con man and content. I appreciate that. Um, he's a master's student with the Fish Ecology Lab at uh, UTS, University of Technology of Sydney. So he's coming to us all the way from Australia. Um, and he studies weedy sea dragons so we have a lot to learn about today uh, i'm really excited about this podcast in particular because like most of them i know nothing about this species but i mean i really know nothing about um about weedy sea dragons i've never learned anything about seahorses or sea dragons or um anything of the kind so today we're going to talk about the threats that they face we're going to talk about sam's research what they do to um, protect the species. Uh, we're probably gonna do some more talking about climate change today, as we did last week with polar bears. Climate change affects everything, but polar bears in particular, like we talked about last week. And then, um, are the donos not working? They're not. I got build, but nothing got added. Okay. Hmm. Shit. Can we send a test on out through here, maybe? Oh no, what's up, Coco? Doing it now, okay. Well, there's a sub. That was me. Okay, but that was a sub. Is there is there not a way you can test a dono? I thought you could test a dono. Did you send a dono? Okay, there's a test dono. Um, another test dono. I don't know, Spoon. Did anyone else donate? Spoon, you donated twice? Mm. Boys, I'm serious. I need your help here. Um, nothing in the activity feed at all. Let me try one. Sorry. Bella, hold. Okay, I just sent a dono to test it. Hey, relax, please. They hear someone outside. Why is this not working? Yeah. 
<laughs> Nothing. Yeah, I did get billed also, though. Shit. Shoot. Okay. Um, I don't know how to do this. Is is this a? Cause. Okay, let me ask him. That's gonna be a problem. This is gonna be an actual problem. Let me call Tara. Hello? Hello. Um, question, I'm live. Can you hear me? That's the question? No, that's, um, <laughs> just that's kidding. just the, <laughs> okay. Um, we've gotten a few donos. It's a podcast. So I think we've gotten like just the over like 25 bucks or something in donos, uh, but none okay. of them are showing up, but I just tested it and got a receipt that said it went through. So it's not the email. I think it's the dono bar. Are they thing. going through your normal page or are they going through? They're going the to um, the email that the organization's email. Okay, but through your normal page. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me take a look at it and I'll call you back. Okay, thank you. All right, sure. Dude, there's nobody there. Relax. Okay. Breezy, thank you for the 12 months. Okay, so I messaged Sam. He's, okay, yeah, no, I definitely went through. He's checking to see if he got the the donations through PayPal. Um, and then Tara's gonna, Tara's gonna look into it. But I guess, so back to what I was saying. I sent a payment to Oh, this is a sub. Okay. What I was saying is that we'll probably talk more about Mike is shit. Or Mike is not good. Really? Is there something wrong with my mic now? No? Okay, dude. Turn up your volume. <laughs> it's coming through on email saying you have an unclaimed payment, but not showing up on PayPal. Is that normal? It's pending? I mean, that's not what happens to me. I think that's fine, right? He just has to claim the payments. Hi. Hey. Uh, so, you connected a new PayPal email, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, any idea if this is a new PayPal account or... I think it is. Okay, so that's probably the issue. Okay. Um, they need to go in and they need to confirm some things on their account so that the payments can go through fully uh once they once the payments go through then we get the information from paypal so uh they probably have to go in and like accept um oh they might also have to it might also be a, con a currency issue they may have to make sure they set it so that they can accept currency outside of their standard currency Okay, so should I try to have him do all this right now or should I just connect it to my email? You might want to just connect to yours and then send him the money. Okay. Because I don't know how long that will take him yeah. to get set up. All right, thank you. All right, no problem. Uh, 
Oh, my accountant's gonna murder me. Alright boys, let's try to connect to my email here. Damn, that's not good. This is not the way I like to do this. Okay. Okay, so we are now connected to my PayPal. Um, let me test it. Or uh, we'll just wait. Let me just send money to myself. I don't think I can even do that. Okay. So, that's how we'll do it today. That's fine. Um, the money will go to me first, and then I will send it over to Sam and the um, Fish Ecology Lab at University of Technology, Sydney. Thank you for being patient. I'm sorry. Here we go. All right. So we got $10 from Spoon, and we got $10 from Rashton. Thank you so much. So we're at, why is it at $10? There we go. Okay. <laughs> um, Spoon, you, just to clarify, you donated $20 prior to this, right? Yeah. Okay, so I will, is it possible to add $20 to this bar without... Is that a thing or no? Otherwise, I can just say that it's plus $20. I'll take a look. Okay, thank you. It's okay if we can't. So, all right. Let's just start over. Today, we're talking to Sam Allen <laughs> with um, the Fish Ecology Lab at UTS, University of Technology, Sydney. He's come to us all the way from Australia. He's teaching us about weedy sea dragons. I know very little about weedy sea dragons, and I, if you don't know things about weedy sea dragons, but you would like to know, feel free to at Saito, and we have our question doc up, so you're welcome to ask questions. If you donate with a question, that obviously gets priority over other questions, but we'll answer a lot of them today. Um, we'll talk about climate change, we'll talk about invasive species, we'll talk about um, a bunch of stuff that is threatening weedy sea dragons and hopefully learn a lot of cool stuff about them today. Sam is a master's student. Um, he does a lot of really cool research. This is a test. Wes, <laughs> thank you for the $50, Wes. I appreciate that so much. Um, we're good. So we're getting rolling. We're, uh, I'm going to have you guys watch this video while I organize myself again a little bit. Um, and then after this i will go ahead and call okay cool luck um i'll go ahead and call sam so watch this for me again Um, the other thing that I forgot to mention is be prepared for a quiz. 
Um, <laughs> at the end of the podcast, there will be a quiz about what we've learned from Sam Allen. It's five questions. You'll have 20 seconds to answer each, each question. Uh, it's scored by who gets the points the fastest and the most correct. If you win, you get a sub to this channel. And if you're already subbed to this channel, I'll gift you a sub to whatever channel you want. Or I'll donate another $5 to Sam. Content, thank you for the 100 bits. And Black, thank you for the four months. I appreciate that. So, let's call Sam. Let's just get this thing rolling. Excuse the scuffness, boys. We're doing our best here, okay. Hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, chat. How is uh, how's the audio here? Yeah, pretty good. Can you? Is my video on as well? Yeah. Hold on one second. Oh my gosh! What is going on? I'm sorry. I'm having a lot of technical uh, difficulties today. <laughs> oh, good. Okay, um, chat, that's not how it's meant to be, though, but, okay, this is fine. Okay, hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm good, how are you? Good, I'm good, sorry about all that. Um, chat, is so, <laughs> right. is his, his volume's okay, my volume's okay? Are we set, then? Yes, okay, cool. Well, thank you for being patient, and thank you so much for coming on. <laughs> Um, I just mentioned in the intro, I'm super excited because I know so little about um, sea dragons or seahorses or <laughs> anything marine, honestly. The way that we find these guests, or the way that we've been doing it lately, is um, we have a species list and we just put them on there because we thought they were so cool um, and interesting looking. Cool. And yeah, and that's how <laughs> that's how I found you. So yeah. Cool. Um, so far, we're at $90 uh, worth of donations. I think you've gotten like Sweet. 20 of that nice. or something and also I'll send you <laughs> the remainder um, at the end of the podcast. But can you tell us uh, before we start where that where those donations are going? Yeah, sure. Um, so pretty much like 100% of the donations that um, like anything that we get today is just going to go directly to basically help fund our research. So like all, all our research that we do is it's all underwater and diving is expensive. Uh, yeah. And we run on pretty low funds with what we do so basically any money that we get will basically help us be able to go up get out on more dive trips get to uh basically collect more data so we can help you know um yeah, once we have more data we're able to kind of you know develop more uh, like conservation strategies and stuff like that but yeah if we if we you know have a few more funds we'll be able to get out um yeah much much more often than we have been able to at the moment especially with everything that's going on the yeah things have slowed down a little bit so cool okay and can you tell us a little bit about what weedy sea dragons are and why you're doing research on them yeah sure uh so weedy sea dragons i don't know if you guys have uh, like seen a photo of what they look like but they're pretty cool looking things uh they get about 40 centimeters long which i think is about 17, 17 inches, inches roughly, yeah 18 inches i think uh -huh. yeah yeah um and so there's basically there's weedy sea dragons and there's leafy sea dragons. Uh -huh. So there's another one that's called the ruby sea dragon that's only been discovered in the last maybe like four years. I think it was 2015 that it got discovered. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, so yeah, there's only three three types of sea dragons, and basically we're doing research on them um, because no one has really done much on them at all. So there isn't a lot known about sea dragons. They are protected in Australia, so you know you can't. You can't go fishing and take them for like an aquarium or something like that mm -hmm. but still it's hard to make like you know like informed conservation decisions if you don't really know a lot about the species so there's only been like a handful of studies actually done on them so what we're hoping to do is just yeah basically look at them um and you know come up with some interesting data and hopefully help protect them a little bit cool and where are they uh located where are they native to uh, so they're native to Australia. Mm -hmm. So weedy sea dragons, they range from a little bit north of Sydney, um, which is where I am now. Uh, and they go all the way down through the southern part of Australia and they come up uh, into Western Australia at about the same the same level across. Uh, so they're at about 33 degrees latitude. Um, 
and that goes pretty much the whole way across the country and then they go all the way down south cool can we pull up uh, that, including uh, tasmania so can we pull up that picture of the map um okay and one of the things that that we've been reading about here is one of the issues that they're facing is that they're moving further north is that am i saying that correctly further south further south my bad and yeah, yeah. can you so, tell us about that why that's a problem yeah sure so uh basically sea dragons their their main habitat is uh kelp or like seaweed that's why they kind of like the way that they look with their kelp habitat they pretty much blend in completely so predators and they're really really hard to find basically so they don't have many predators uh, and basically what's happening is we think they're starting to move or maybe starting to move further south because at like the northern edge of where they're found, they're, the kelp habitat which they live on is slowly uh, kind of getting you know degraded due to climate change and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, so there's been like a little bit further north of where you find sea dragons. There's been uh, places where, you know, like 15 years ago it was covered in kelp uh, and now it's just all gone because you've got uh, certain types of, you know, number one, the heat is makes it tough for the kelp to live, but you also have like certain kinds of fish that come down um, and fish that come down and basically you find them where they're not supposed to be and they eat all the kelp, which mm -hmm. means that then there's not as much habitat for sea dragons. So if that keeps happening further and further down the coast, basically you're just going to lose the sea dragon habitat all the way down. If you lose the habitat, then you lose the dragons. So we want to try and if we can, uh, you know, kind of show that that's happening um, a bit more so than already has been that's already out there then would be good yeah for sure vina thank you for the five dollar donation so we're looking at a picture on screen right now of um a sea dragon in in a kelp forest um, so i think that's a <laughs> yeah. cool picture are they so they just live in kelp do they live in um coral reefs as well no no, no. um so you do get other kinds of like uh little pipe fish which are related to sea dragons or seahorses that live in coral reefs but yeah you only find sea dragons where there's kelp like in southern australia okay so then so one of the issues then is is habitat loss because of invasive species feeding on that kelp climate change yep. um yep. what else what are other issues that they face um a big issue for kind of overall like seahorses sea dragons and pipe fish is the traditional Chinese medicine industry. Uh -huh. uh, so they get used a lot. Sea dragons haven't been as much, like they aren't as exploited as seahorses, but we're still kind of worried that they could be taken a little bit. Um, but basically, yeah, they, they have a really, really high value in the traditional Chinese um, medicine market. So For that's another big threat now. What, what's, what's the medicinal use? Like how, how does that work? <laughs> Yeah, I don't really know what they actually that what they actually use them for. I don't know too much about um, Chinese medicine, but basically they take them uh, and they just dry them out and they get like ground down to a powder. And I'm not sure what the powder is used for, but huh. yeah. Okay, well that's a good segue um, into one of the first questions that we've had in chat here. Vizzo asked, "Is a seahorse and sea dragon the same?" No, they're from the same family. Um, but they're not the same. So a sea dragon can, yeah, like I said, can get up to about, you know, 40, 45 centimeters, like 17, 18 inches. Whereas a seahorse, the biggest seahorse you'll see is about 10 centimeters, whatever. I'm not sure what that is oh. in inches. But yeah. yeah. And see, so another big difference is sea dragons are free swimming. So what that means is when they have their kelp, sea dragons swim like above the kelp or in through the kelp. Uh, and they're, they're always swimming. Whereas a seahorse, what a seahorse does is it has what we'll call a prehensile tail. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a monkey, how a monkey can like hang down from a tree using its tail to hang yeah. on. A seahorse does that. Uh, and they'll like hold on to a little bit of seaweed or a bit of coral or something like that. Mm -hmm. And they'll just eat stuff as it comes past. They'll wait for food to come to them. Whereas a sea dragon will swim around looking for food all the time. Okay, cool. Um, this is not a question for chat, but I should have asked this earlier. How did you get into... To this program and and how'd you get interested in sea dragons um well i didn't know a lot about sea dragons really kind of until i started um started doing my master's so i was i did my undergraduate um degree in marine biology and i was like really interested in like tropical fish and stuff like that mm -hmm. uh, and then i was just having a talk to my who's my now my supervisor i was having a talk to him 
just about kind of what research projects he had available. And he was saying to me that he had this Sweetie Sea Dragon project. Uh, and once I kind of like looked into a little bit, saw that there wasn't much done on them, thought that, you know, could hopefully help out with the conservation side of things. Okay. Um, and they're just, I mean, they're just so cool. Like, why wouldn't you want to work with them? Yeah, they're beautiful. I, I, we're yeah. so excited to talk about them today. Um, <laughs> lots, okay, lots of questions that I'm seeing here. Um, <laughs> one, so Guy asked, how long are sea dragons around? Maybe, like, how long have they been around? Might be the question he's asking. Like, as in, when were they discovered? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so, the weedy sea dragon was discovered, well, like, first described by scientists in, I think it was 1804. Okay. Um, by some French guy. I can't remember what his name. What a crazy but, discovery um, that must have been, just to see that yeah, like, I know, in right? the ocean. That's sick. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then the leafy sea dragon, I think, was 1872. Okay. Um, but yeah, no, oh. I didn't say before. The leafy sea dragon has a has a much smaller range, so you only find that uh, in South Australia and the bottom of Western Australia. So that one's a lot more, a lot harder to see as well because it's got all those leafy looking like things coming off it. For sure. Got um, Sai, thank you for the six dollars and sixty nine cents. Um, floppy <laughs> with a hundred dollars. Oh, thank you thank you. <laughs> thank you for the donation so um thank you thank you thank you the donations today That's you guys awesome. are, are going to support uh the research that sam does with uts and with um, the fish ecology lab so they'll they'll do mm -hmm. research on the weedy sea dragons that we're talking about today if you have a question you can at cyto um we already have a decent amount of questions so if you don't mind i'll start um start asking you some of the ones that chat has already come up with um i've been yeah, kind of letting them build up remy asked why are their snouts shaped like that <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's because it's because of the prey that they eat. So they have a really, really long snout. So if you compare that photo to a seahorse uh -huh. um, that has a really short snout, basically the long snout makes them means they're able to eat prey that moves really quickly. So uh -huh. the main prey for a sea dragon is something called a mysid shrimp. So it's basically like a, a shrimp that's about like half an inch long. So they're really, really small and they're really, really fast. So the longest snout, basically what it does is when it moves around, it's kind of like a vacuum. So when they when they see a little shrimp, they kind of go up next to it and then they suck water in through their mouth. And because it's really long, it gets like it's got quite a high velocity and the water all rushes into the mouth. And as the water comes in, it sucks in the shrimp with it. Oh wow. Yeah. That's crazy. Good question, Remy. Yeah, it's pretty um, cool. <laughs> Chris, thank you for the twelve dollars. Appreciate that. Um Okay. Let's see you. LX asked, are the males the ones that get pregnant like seahorses? Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, but most seahorses have like a pouch, kind of like a like a kangaroo does, you know, and mm -hmm. they, they hold their eggs in the pouch. But I don't know if you've seen a photo yet of a, of a male dragon with eggs on its tail. Um, uh -huh. that's, yeah, we that's watched a, cool. a video at the intro. Oh, sweet, yeah. Um, but yeah, so the basically the female, you know, makes the eggs and then... The male's tail goes all spongy uh -huh. uh, and then it deposits. They can have about 200 eggs, roughly, go onto the tail. Um, and that's Jeez. the same for leafy sea dragons. Um, and, yeah, so the males all, the males calm, yeah, carry all the eggs. That's a, How many of those, uh, like, are successful in hatching? Not many. Not uh, many? <laughs> 200? Yeah. The more, like, most of them will hatch, uh -huh. um, but the mortality rate once they actually hatch is, like, upwards of 90 percent so there's only there's Jeez. a very small amount that actually make it and that's because they're really they're, they're quite slow swimmers so mm -hmm. when they're young if they get found by you know a big fish that wants to eat it they're done pretty much that's why the males sorry not the males the adults um don't yeah don't really have problems with predation because they're just so well camouflaged that nothing can find them so yeah but yeah, they not did so look, much for the little babies. They looked super, super fragile <laughs> in that video that we yeah. watched. <laughs> like, yeah, they are. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a there's a big problem with um, like with them being fragile. When you get really, really big storms and like really big waves, you get really high rates of mortality. Like, lots of them will because they can't swim very well. They just like if there's really big waves, they get washed off, you know, their home and end oh. up just washing up onto the beach. And a lot of them die in big storms. So that's a problem too. That's so sad. Jeez. Um, <laughs> Speaking of speed, Dom asked, how fast can weedy sea dragons go? Do you have a number for that, or is it just slow? <laughs> I don't have an exact number, but okay. 
very slow. <laughs> okay. Very slow. All right. Yeah. Um, so, is there a problem? Well, Fisk asked, is there a problem with hunting with sea dragons? No, not really. Um, so, you can't, in Australia, they're, yeah, they're fully protected, which means you can't fish them uh, or anything like that. So, whenever you're seeing them around here, yeah, it's good. There's no, there's no fishing pressure. There's no hunting pressure. So that, like nice. from a conservation side of things, that's really, really good. We don't have to deal with the issues like climate change and stuff. Okay. They don't have to do with fishing, which is good. Nice. So um, if they're not, not affected by humans hunting them, username asked, what's their natural predator? Uh, when they're, like I said, when they're babies, they, they have predators of like, um, you know, bigger fish that, you know, eat that prey on smaller fish but mm -hmm. once they get bigger um, both weedy and leafy sea dragons essentially have no predators because they just they camouflage so well like it's it really is difficult to find them so good um <laughs> basically yeah basically nothing nothing preys on them which is really good raptor thank you for the five dollars content with the bits appreciate thank that you. um oh shoot i just lost her. oh um how long do they take to reach reproductive maturity so they're, when they're little, it's like 90% die. Then how long does it take? Uh, it's about a year, a year to two years. Like there, there's been documents of like males having babies within, you know, in their first kind of reproductive cycle. Okay. Um, but it's probably more common for two years. Um, Jester, thank you for the five dollars. Um, thank that you. that is quite a bit of time when they're when they're so little and slow to get mm -hmm. picked off. So. Yeah. That's yeah. too bad. Jeez. <laughs> but there's, you know, another another kind of problem is there hasn't been many long-term population kind of studies. So there's, there's really only been one, like, that has showed declines and the other, like, that was actually, like, you know, scientifically published and stuff like that that showed pretty steep declines. Um, so it is a bit hard sometimes to tell how many... You know, like I said, there's a lot of them die once once they actually um, hatch, but then it's kind of hard to tell how many of them actually make it to sexual maturity. Yeah. But yeah, it's not it's not a very high number. Yeah. Wait, so one of the ways that you guys monitor in the video that we watched is through citizen mm -hmm. science, right? Mm -hmm. So people yeah. take photos yeah. when they're diving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a really kind of big part of what we do. We want to we just want to keep trying to get that bigger and bigger. So basically, what you can do um is we get people to take a photo of the sea dragon on the side so if you get a photo of both sides of the sea dragon what you can then do is that this has been done with you know other species like they did it with great white sharks and whale sharks um is they have spots on them so every sea dragon has individual spots in the same way that every leopard has different spots uh, and there's a there's a software program called i3s manta Mm -hmm. And basically, with that side photo that we get off people, they, you can do it yourself as well. Um, is basically you put it into this program and you go through, and there's a certain little part of the sea dragon, just it's a bit hard to describe where, but like in the middle where there's lots of spots. Mm -hmm. uh, and you circle a bunch of the spots, and what it'll do is it'll put it into the database. Yeah. And then that database will go through and compare if that sea dragon has been found before. And then we've got this big Excel sheet of basically all the sea dragons that we've found through um, that have been like found through citizen science and stuff like that. And kind of the big draw card is we, if you find a sea dragon that no one has done before, then you get to name it after yourself, which is pretty cool. Oh, how cool. I was wondering where the names came from because there's like, yeah. the names were like David and yeah. like, there's like people. Yeah. Names. So if you, if you're, if you put it into the system and it comes up as an unrecognized sea dragon, then you get to put it in and be like, oh, sweet. And call this one, Sam. That's, That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, okay, let me look at some of the other questions that we have here. A lot of questions, guys. Thank you. Um, Z, I don't know how to say your name. I'm sorry. ZPH said, what do you think is the coolest sea dragon adaptation? The camouflage, for sure. Yeah, they're like, crazy looking. Yeah, yeah. It's just like, I mean, I do all my work on weedy sea dragons but the camouflage of leafy sea dragons is just incredible like mm -hmm. I've, I've never seen one of those because they're they're only down in south australia but just the way like they just look like a floating piece of seaweed like it's it's absolutely crazy what they yeah. look like but i think that's definitely the, the coolest adaptation 
sent with the dollar and 90 cents thank you <laughs> for the donation um let's see we also have viz asked the tail of a male leafy sea dragon will turn bright yellow when he's ready to mate is that true of the leafy sea dragon yeah yeah so the leafy sea dragons are green um not not so much it's not like a bright fluorescent yellow but it will kind of you know go like a bit a bit more yellow and then like also what they do is become spongy uh -huh. so you can also tell like after a sea dragon if it's got no eggs left you can tell that it's been pregnant because if you look at its tail it'll have like all the little the little uh imprints of where all the eggs were so that oh. always looks kind of cool when you see that too interesting um mm. speaking of which ice cold asked how do sea dragons breed how do they breed yeah yeah uh so weedy sea dragons do this i don't i don't know might have been in the video i don't know um they have like a really cool courtship dance so basically two you dragons will come that. together and they they sit like next to each other and do this really pretty cool dance like underwater where they both like curl their, ta curl their tails out and swing around each other mm -hmm. uh and then basically um yeah i mean the the female like will create the eggs will get pregnant and then once she has the eggs then they'll all just be deposited onto the tail of the male huh. and then the male it, for about 30 to 38 days it takes usually for them to hatch um so the male will sit just usually the males who are pregnant um don't spend a lot of time out where you would normally find sea dragons they try they tuck really deep into the seaweed so they can um hide even better than normal to make sure they don't get eaten neat um so i don't just link the video of the courtship dance let's see if we can find this Hang on. oh yeah yeah cool. i think it was on yeah it was on i think maybe blue planet or something a, a while ago like a video of them doing the, the courtship dance it was, it was pretty cool gosh they're so cool looking are they all like yeah. similar colors or like this yeah. like purple and yellow kind of yeah so that that's why we that's why we use this this software of the spots because they all look really really similar so it's yeah. really hard to tell like if you're just going down it's it's pretty much impossible to tell whether or not that's a new sea dragon so you need oh. to use that that software that's so cool um we just we saw some of the dance there um <laughs> let's see we have so we talked we touched on this earlier Sheer, thank you for the five dollars um sai with the two dollars appreciate that um thank you Am Yam asked, how are sea dragons infected by invasive, affected by invasive species? So we talked about it earlier. In the research that um, Saito did today, he uh, found a lot about sea urchins being a problem. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so sea urchins is a big problem in down in places like Tasmania, like down in, like right at the bottom of Australia. So uh -huh. I what we have down there is they're called giant kelp forests. So they have the same kind of kelp in California, I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. And basically it's a re it's a big bit of kelp. It can be about 12 meters high. Uh, wow. And basically what, yeah, they're, they're pretty cool. But basically what happens with the sea urchins is uh, as the ocean gets warmer, baby sea urchins basically just float along in ocean currents until they get big enough to settle on a rock. Uh -huh. And then they'll just crawl around that rock eating the algae and stuff that they can find. So. Basically what's happening as the ocean's getting warmer, you're getting a lot more sea urchins coming down that far south. And what they're doing is establishing on these rocks and then they start eating all this seaweed. So um, it's a yeah, big problem for, for sea dragons down in Tasmania and like Southern Victoria. Um, like, yeah, a lot of them are losing their habitat to sea urchins because sea urchins eat a lot. And if there's more sea urchins down there, then obviously more sea urchins can breed in that southern area so the numbers are just kind of exploding and you're getting massive massive decreases in the amounts of kelp which is drastically affecting the sea dragon like habitat yeah. Jeez. um mm. so there's a, a picture of sea urchins um on screen right now thank you for the question that was a good one um yeah it was a good one a related question is from messi he asked what are their main competitors um they don't have many to be honest um, like their biggest issue with competition is is basically just just what I said is losing their habitat to other animals. They don't really have 
uh, competition for food. It's more so the competition that they have for other animals starting to eat away their habitat. But okay. with the food that they eat, they're pretty much the only thing that kind of eats those those little shrimp, um, mm-hmm. those little mice shrimp that I was talking about, those really fast things. And that's because of that really long snout they have. Um, a lot of animals aren't adapted to be able to eat tiny little shrimp that can move that fast. Mm-hmm. Um, what is their conservation status listed as right now? At the moment, it's listed as least concern, which is okay. not good in my eyes because basically, so up until 2006, they were listed as data deficient. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in 2000, it, in, then when it got reassessed in 2006, they got put up to near threatened. Um, mm-hmm. That was as a result of a lot of work that our lab did back then because we've been looking at them for about 20 years or so. Um, yeah, so they got upgraded to near threatened. And then recently they got, I think it was 2015 or 2016, they got dropped back down to least concern. But we uh, kind of were hoping, you know, by the time I come to the end of my work, we were hoping to maybe try and challenge that to either get them put back to data deficient or get them back up to near threatened because mm-hmm. we think that, you know, they, they dropped that down. But um, I, like I said at the start, there's only been one long-term population study done uh, and that was by us, and it showed declines, and that was from where we are in Sydney all the way down to Tasmania. So, got it. We like we have noted population declines, and you know we've talked to people. This not as scientific, but you know we've talked to people who've been diving certain areas for 30, 40 years, and they used to see twenty sea dragons, and now they see you know maybe two or three of that. So, jeez. Um, we think populations are dropping, but we just need to prove it. Okay. Yeah, some of chat was a little bit confused by that. I he's not saying that he wants there to be less <laughs> of them. He's he's saying I think that if they're listed as near threatened or, or one of the more threatened uh categories, then does that mean more protection for them? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's what he's saying. He's it means <laughs> like internationally, yeah. Internationally they'll be more protected if they get to a higher level of okay. conservation status. Got it. Got it. Nice. Um, Belinda with the six dollars said, "Love your work, Sam. Thank you. For the, <laughs> thank you for the donation." Thanks, Belinda. And Mac, sure. thank you for the five dollars. We're at two hundred and thirty-six dollars. Oh, two hundred and four fifty-six dollars. Awesome. Um, so thank you. Um, awesome. Thank you. Let's see. Other questions that we have. Uh, Ward asked, "How long do they live for?" Um, that's a that's a hard one because. There hasn't been, um, you know, people going down and just looking at the same sea dragon until right. it dies very often. But there has been sea dragons in captivity that live up to nine years. Oh, okay. So we we say that their average kind of lifespan in the wild is yeah up to about seven or eight years, I would say. Is there any captive breeding that's done? Uh, yeah, there has been a little bit. A lot of it hasn't been all that successful, but there's been... Um, They've been bred in a couple of aquariums, some in Florida, a couple in Georgia and uh, Tennessee as well. Nice. So that like the more successful breeding has definitely been done in America um, rather than over here. I think, I think there's an aquarium in Singapore as well. that's maybe done a bit of successful breeding, but yeah, it would, it would be good to try and um, get, you know, get a little bit more, if that could become a bit more prevalent just in case, you know, as like a reserve stock, obviously we just want to pre- try and protect them in the wild, but. Yeah. It never hurts to have like a successful breeding program just in case you need it, you know? For sure. Yeah, the video that we saw, I think, was from Monterey Bay Aquarium, was them hatching, um, B, which is California. Oh. B Finster, thank you for okay, the $20. Cool. Yeah. Glue with the dollar um, and 51 cents <laughs> or 53 cents. Appreciate <laughs> thank it. Thank you. Um, so here's a more. A little bit more sciencey question. Um, Big Pharma mm-hmm. asked, "Is ocean acidification one of the main concerns for the kelp forest becoming smaller and smaller?" Uh, yeah, a little bit, but more like we have more of an issue. Like we think more of the issue is coming from um, from ocean warming rather than acidification. Okay. There has been some studies that have shown that acidification, you know, does have negative impacts on kelp, but I think a lot of the um, the negative impacts of acidification have definitely come on coral reefs as well. But yeah, it, it, it definitely isn't good because you do get some sort of kelp, like some kelps that um, if there's, if it's a higher acidification, like when they're younger, it's just harder for them to grow. So they'll basically just grow slower. Uh, and if they grow slower, then things like sea urchins and the small fish are able to eat them much more easily when they're smaller. So. 
Got it. Faye with twenty five dollars. Thanks, Faye. Um, Thanks, Faye. She really likes <laughs> sea dragon, so that can be it for today. Um, <laughs> so one of the questions that uh, I guess Saito has is: Can Sam elaborate on how the Eastern Australian current is driving invasive species into weedy sea dragon habitat and play a role in ocean warming? Yeah, sure. Uh, so the biggest thing with the invasive species coming down in the East Australian current, and we do quite a lot of research on this like uh, in our team as well, uh, is you have a lot of... So on a coral reef, um, which we have obviously up in the Great Barrier Reef, uh-huh. you have a lot of fish that are herbivorous, so they eat a lot of algae mm-hmm. uh, and little bits of seaweed. And the reason they do that on a coral reef is because a coral reef has coral you know it does it's not covered in seaweed and things like that so these little herbivorous fish play a really important role in eating you know keeping all that algae away so the corals can be the main form of habitat um so what happens with invasive species coming down through the east australian current is basically fish fish larvae so like baby fish uh they're what we call planktonic so what that means is they just they're basically at the mercy of the ocean's currents Mm -hmm. so they get pushed out into sea uh, and then once they hit the East Australian current, they get dragged further and further down. So as the East Australian current gets stronger and pushes further south, you're getting these little tropical fish, these herbivorous fish that live on the reef. But when they're on the reef, they have a really, really important role. But when they get pushed further south down into Sydney um, and like you know other places around Sydney, what they do is then, yeah, they start eating all that kelp. So if they mm-hmm. find... Like they have trouble eating the big established kelp, but if you have new kelp that's trying to, you know, basically establish itself and keep going and grow up into, you know, big new kelp forests, if you have all these herbivorous fish that have come down from the reef, they eat all that baby kelp. So there was a study done, um, it was published about three or four years ago in 2016, and um, basically showed an, an area up probably about maybe six or seven hours north of Sydney probably still about 10 hours south of the end of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, basically, in about 2002, that area had about 80% kelp coverage. Uh-huh. And then as the East Australian current was getting stronger and you got more and more fish come down, by 2010, all of the kelp was gone. Um, so there, there wasn't sea dragons living that far up, but we're worried that you know if the East Australian keeps getting stronger, which it is, and we've seen more and more tropical fish starting to come down, mm-hmm. um, then eventually, you know, all the kelp will disappear from here and further and further south. Like we're not too sure how long that's going to take, but if it does happen and when it does happen, then the sea dragons won't have anywhere to go. Like they can't live on, because if they live on rocks, they're too slow to outrun predators. So they entirely rely on the kelp um, to stop other things eating them. Okay. Saito, good question. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Um, we got a few donations here. Lauren tip three dollars said hi Sam. If you know Lauren, maybe not. <laughs> um, yeah, Dill... probably my girlfriend. I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> hi. <laughs> um, <laughs> Dill tip five dollars. Uh, Drux with twenty and a little W with five dollars. Um, thank you. So we're at uh, three hundred and thirty-five dollars. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, and ninety-five cents. Thanks, so guys. thank you. Um, okay, a few other questions that we have here. Uh, Mm-hmm. I'll put these two questions together because they're similar. Nick and Zug- Zuger asked, are they social or like do they travel in groups? Um, there has been like, you know, documents of, of sea dragons being in groups, but typically they're pretty solitary animals. Like you, okay. if, if they are in groups, it's because they're mating. Like it's not that they like actively avoid other sea dragons it's just there's not that many of them around so they just kind of float off doing their own thing looking for their own food okay they definitely don't yeah hang around other sea dragons very much cool um carman with ten dollars uh so tip ten dollars with a question uh so that question was how have the australia fires affected marine life that's a good question yeah it is a good question um well it, it was really hard like during the fires we because we just we couldn't get out in the water very much because mm-hmm. like what was happening like the fires were so bad that everywhere you're going around there was just ash like in the water like you, you'd get in the water and you know you, you couldn't see like six foot in front of your face because there was just 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 so oh, much geez. dirt and ash in the water so it's been kind of hard to see like you know what's happened to the marine life like 
in terms of the sea dragon populations, we haven't noticed anything, you know, like massively out of the ordinary, like as a result of the fires. But like, then again, we, there was a good probably two, two months where, you know, the whole country was on fire and we couldn't, we just couldn't get in to look at them. Like it was really hard to get in the water. Right. So once that finished, but a big problem with like, once there was like all the ash and stuff on top of the water is like, it did lower the oxygen levels a little bit, but Mm. if, if the marine life was in an area where, you know, there's lots of wet action and stuff like that, then it was, you know, cycling it through and it was okay. There was, um, you know, issues with it in like fresh water, like going into the rivers and stuff like that, because ash was, you know, it was, like I said before, like it was falling on top. It was just creating like a big drop in oxygen. So we did have, I don't know if you guys um, had seen all the fish kills that we had, but um, basically what it was, was in like our biggest rivers, like inland, we just had like thousands and thousands of like really, really old and like iconic fish, like just dying. So basically you'd like have a river and there was just like hundreds and thousands of fish just floating up to the surface dead because oh. there's a lot like we don't really know what that was from yet. There's a lot of research going into it at the moment, um, mm-hmm. but it's too soon to really tell what, what caused it. But it was kind of around the time of the fires and some of it happened a little bit before as well. So, Jeez. Okay, good question. That's mm. awful and really sad. I hadn't heard about that um, at all. Yeah, they were really, really bad. There was... We had um, the Murray cod, which is one of like our most famous fish species. You know, there was fish that were like 150 years old that were just dying because, yeah, really bad droughts, really bad fires. Everything was just the perfect storm. So Rocky with a $50 donation, um, Danny with $15 cents with a dollar. Uh, So Danny, Rocky, thank you so much, always uh, on the podcast. Um, Danny donated a question, said, do they usually stay as one pair during mating season or are the females capable of laying more eggs in other males' brood pouches? Uh, typically, like we, sea dragons are, are considered to be pretty monogamous, which okay. like meaning they only mate with one, one other animal. Right. Um, so basically... A male can carry eggs twice during the breeding season. So the breeding season usually goes from about July to January. Um, Sea dragons in warmer water can breed earlier because so sea drag, like up in Sydney where I am, they can breed, you know, in like those late winter months of July and August. Mm -hmm. Um, But then like when you get into summer and you're down further south in like January, you get like a lot of, um, a lot of those southern sea dragons. That's when they carry a lot of eggs. But the ones in the warmer waters, yeah, they can, they can have eggs like twice within the season. So right. I think the quickest time that we've seen like a turnaround from, you know, a sea dragon being um, like a male sea dragon having eggs, hatching those eggs. So that takes about, yeah, like 30, 38 days to hatch the eggs. And then it was another 50 or 60, 60 days, I think, after that, um, it was pregnant again. So that's, that's the, the females amazing. don't go around just laying eggs with heaps of males, but the males can be pregnant more than once in a season. Nice. So we're looking at a picture. Thanks for pulling this up, guys. Um, looking at a picture here of looks like eggs. Yeah, it's crazy how many there are. Um, yeah, up to two hundred. That's wild. Yeah. So this mm. would be a male then. Um, nice. Yeah. Cool. Um, you, you can also tell with the like if it's a male or a female without it has the eggs. Uh huh. It's um. So basically, the the females have a much like deeper and kind of like fatter body. So in the middle, they'll they'll basically look more round, whereas a male is going to look much much thinner, and like the bottom of its stomach kind of comes like up like this, whereas the female is like a bit more round, sort of like that. Interesting. Is there a reason for for that, or is it just? Uh, I th- I would imagine it would have um, something to do with the extra weight that the male has to carry mm. uh, when it has the eggs on its tail. Like I think if it um, and also probably the having the biggest stomach on the female is where it actually, you know, creates the eggs as well. So it can okay. then deposit it onto the male. Got it. Um, sacred to $10 with a question said, what is the great barrier for jumpstarting conservation awareness? Also, do you know, uh, Taika? No, no, I don't. Um, and I'm also a little bit confused by your question. What's the, what's the great barrier for jumpstarting? Do you mean like, what's different? You mean like, what's the, yeah. <laughs> Sure, that's a uh, big I, question. I, yeah. <laughs> I guess, um, you know, even though there are pretty, 
like iconic species you'd be amazed how many people just don't just don't know about them like yeah. um so we in a uh, victoria the state which is the one south of where i am in new south wales it's the marine state emblem is mm-hmm. the weedy sea dragon and in south australia the state emblem is the leafy sea dragon but yeah i would say the biggest the biggest issue is just awareness so the big thing about sea dragons as well is because they're such like an iconic and kind of charismatic looking species mm-hmm. um what we're kind of hoping to do as well is like really use them as like an icon for conservation. So mm-hmm. in the same way that if you think about like a polar bear, you think of melting ice caps. So you think about, right. yeah, we did our last, you know, our podcast last week was polar bears, black bears. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what we're hoping to do is if we can, you know, raise enough awareness about sea dragons is we'll be able to hopefully use them as a bit of a con- uh, conservation icon for the kelp forests of Australia, because you know, people think of Australian marine wildlife, they think of the Great Barrier Reef, but the kelp the kelp forests cover, like, an enormous amount of the country, like, more yeah. than the Great Barrier Reef. So there's so much marine life in there, which, like, also needs protecting. So if we can really, you know, drum up support for sea dragons, because they're such, like, a unique-looking species. Yeah. If, if you can protect the habitat just for one species, you know, in turn, you're protecting, like, you know, hundreds, thousands of other species just by helping the habitat of one. Yeah, for sure um sigh with another dollar thank you uh k jello with 15 dollars and lord with three dollars uh you. said hey sam do you prefer the leafy or the weedy sea dragon <laughs> <laughs> i mean all my work's on the weedy so mm-hmm. i guess i've got to say the weedy but the leafy okay. ones i mean objectively probably look cooler they are <laughs> they're pretty really sick awesome. <laughs> um yeah. so a question that i've been wanting to ask because i'm super curious uh, was from mm-hmm. Pow Pow. I'm sorry, I cannot say these names. Man, um, said, "What does a typical day look like studying the sea dragons in lava or out in the ocean?" Uh yeah. So basically, you know, if we're actually if we're out in the field, what we do uh, is we go through. You know, we'll be diving obviously because you have to be. They live at about ten or twelve meters deep. Like you, you can't snorkel and see them. Okay. So we'll go diving. Uh, and when we're down there, we take um, a lot of tape measures. We take a lot of cameras because um, you've only got a certain amount of time you can be underwater, obviously. So what we do is we, my main study site, uh, at the moment we have a big, long, about 350, probably about 400 yard transect. Mm-hmm. Um, and so basically what that is, is we go along and film that whole transect. And what I'm doing is analyzing what kind of habitat there is there. So what I want to do with that is basically work out um, how much seaweed or kelp is in that habitat so we can see what, like, because where I work, there's a lot of sea dragons and we know that they like where that is. So if there's, let's let's say there's 60% coverage of kelp there uh, and there's lots of sea dragons and then you go, you know, a couple of kilometres away to a new beach and there's only 20% and there's no kelp, then we can, you know, we can kind of say that, oh, look, there's more kelp there, there's less kelp there. The 60% is what they need to live. So we spend a lot of time, you know, doing that. Um, but then once you're actually diving, you probably spend, uh, you know, for two for two dives worth, like an hour, maybe two hours, probably two hours underwater, you spend probably two days on the computer analyzing all the footage mm-hmm. and like going through and doing all the data entry and stuff like that. Okay. So it's oh, fun cool. when you're in the water, but then you got to spend a lot of time on the computer as well. So here's the video um, of a dive with, yeah, we see tape oh, measures cool. and very, very We're, cool. Yeah. So have you yeah. been, how long have you been so diving if, for? If, um, well, I dived a couple of times when I was, when I was younger, like I'd been on like family holidays to Fiji and we, we dived a couple of times over there, but mm-hmm. uh, I really only started um, when I worked out that I was going to do Weedy Sea Dragons because you had to, you had to dive. Like I've been yeah. snorkeling my whole life, but actually diving probably about maybe, maybe a year, year and a half. Nice. Very cool. Yeah, I've but never done awesome diving. Life. I've only ever snorkeled. It's, oh, it's amazing. You should definitely do it. It's good. Yeah, it's a whole different world down there, huh? Um, yeah, for sure. Space just asked, what's the max depth he has dived? I have dived? Yeah. Uh, I got to 28 meters in Fiji. Because it was just like crystal okay. blue water. Yeah. That's crazy. Um... But yeah, the deepest in Sydney is only like the deepest for diving for sea dragons is like 
17 meters. Is that really nine? That's like 90 feet. Well, no, the your deepest dive is like 90 feet. That's absurd. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> um, cool. Oh yeah, there's just wow. Their camouflage is insane. I, we're we have this video up on yeah. screen. I couldn't even tell that that was uh, a sea dragon at first. Uh, yeah. That's crazy. So that is that is a bit of a problem with um, when we're down there, as you know, we sometimes you just run out of time and you haven't found them because they're just they're so well camouflaged. So you occasionally you'll have a dive where you just don't see any if you don't have the best visibility. Um, like you know they're there, but you just sometimes you just can't find them. Like, yeah. It's so hard to find. Yeah. How cool. Um. So, a question here that I am also really interested in. Uh, I know that they've done some artificial installations of coral reefs. Uh, Tietl asked, have there been any efforts to artificially plant new kelp forests? Sai with a dollar donation and Spoon with the $11 before. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, yeah, they have. So there's a big project going on at the moment. Um, it's called Project Crayweed. It's not uh, It's not through our lab, but it's through like one of our kind of um, collaborators. Uh, and yeah, so in the same way that they've been trying to like regenerate the coral reefs, they, they basically have they attach, you know, small like baby bits of kelp to these like metal frameworks uh, and then basically cement them onto a rock underwater mm -hmm. uh, and then you leave them and yeah, hopefully they grow up. But still like yeah. even with those ones, those ones that you're putting in, like if they're small enough, you still have that issue, like I was saying before, of those new herbivorous fish coming down to eat. Okay. So yeah, it's, it's a tough one now, but they have tried, definitely. Okay. Um... Gosh, there's so many questions. Guys, we're definitely, we're not going to be able to get to all of these questions today, but I do appreciate you asking them. They're really, really good. Yeah. Um, Glad people are interested. Okay, so there's a similar question. So we'll do that one. Um, Dagger asked, do they have skeletons or are they made up of cartilage? Uh, they have an uh, external skeleton. So if you touch a sea dragon, it's it's like bone. It's really, really hard. That's um, surprising. Which is, which yeah, they kind okay. of look, they don't really look like they would be, but yeah, they've got an external skeleton. Cool. Um, mm. Okay, we got Brick asked, how do they move? Like, how do, how do they swim? So, like, yeah, like, maybe or, how do they propel themselves in water? Yeah, okay, so most fish um, have their tail fin, and a lot of fish will use their tail fin and their um, pectoral fin, so, like, the fins on the side to kind of, like, propel themselves through the water. Uh -huh. But if you look at the photo of the sea dragon, they obviously don't have those fins. Uh -huh. um, so what they have is on their like back and on their kind of stomachs, they have these really fine looking, they, they look like little fans almost. And basically they just like undulate and they wiggle basically. And that helps them go, you know, oh, I see. move. But like I said before, they, they really do move slowly. Like, and they're really placid. So like you could even... You know, um, when you're taking a photo of them to identify the sea dragon, like if you can't get onto the other side of it, you can just quickly like whip it around like that. <laughs> yeah, <it's... laughs> it just like doesn't it's, go. It's pretty easy yeah. to do. You just or you just like flick some water around it, and it will turn around because they're really just pretty Hello. useless swimmers. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, I'm. We'll do a couple more questions, guys. If you're if you're just uh, if you're just tuning in here, we're talking to Sam Allen. He does uh, research in. Australia on weedy sea dragons um, with mm -hmm. the fish ecology lab cyber with ten dollars thank you so much um, thank you so fish ecology lab the University of Technology in Sydney um, they do a bunch of research on marine life on on uh, tropical or not tropical fish is it tropical fish tropical is that fish, as well. tropical fish? Yeah. yeah we do um, tropical fish yep yeah. seahorses sea dragons so the the donations today are going to the research that that Sam does and we're at four hundred seventy eight dollars and seventy four cents in donations thank you if you have donated awesome. and if you can't thank donate you. uh one of the things that we talked about earlier was that one of the most important parts about the research and about um helping the the weedy sea dragons is the spreading awareness for them so if you're not able to donate but you're still watching that means a lot also so thank you so much for being here i know there are some of you that are new here so thank you for being here um Let's do just a couple more questions, if you don't mind. There are so many, you guys. Thank you so much. These are really good questions. Um, we'll save that one for the end. Let's see. And da -da 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 -da. 
get asked, are red sea dragons that rare? Ruby sea dragons? Yeah. Yeah, um, yes. Because the reason they're so rare is they've only been discovered, they only got discovered in 2015. Yeah. Uh, and scientists think they're red because red is the first, when you go underwater, red is the first color that you lose because it ha because of its wavelength. So as soon as you go underwater, the reason we think they're red is because ruby sea dragons live at minimum 50 meters depth. I'm not sure that is in feet, but it's deep. Yeah. <laughs> um, so once you get down that low, there's hardly any light getting through. So a red sea dragon uh, in really dark water is, is almost invisible. So wow. they're really, really, really hard to sample because you need really good lights to get down there. And it's so expensive and labor intensive to actually get down to like 50 plus meters of depth and also once you get down there you just you know you just kind of got to search blindly until you find one and there's only been i think maybe like five or six actually seen in the wild so yeah they are extremely extremely rare that's crazy it's it's crazy to think about how much is in the ocean that we still don't know about <laughs> you discover yeah, things like that know. yeah it's crazy um, yeah okay so last question we'll ask here um Username OP asked, how likely is their extinction without human intervention? Oh, that's a good question. Tough question. Big question. Yeah. Um, it's, it's hard to know. Like, I, I think without human intervention, like if we just continue, you know, with business as usual, carbon emissions, carbon emissions and, what, and whatnot, like, yeah, they, they definitely will eventually go extinct. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to be an extremely rapid process like because they have quite a large population area but definitely sea dragons like the ones that i'm looking at at the northern raging scent are by far the most vulnerable like they are really if we don't start doing things like the sea dragons at their northern raging scent we'll lose the habitat and they either are going to have to move south which they're not really capable of doing or those ones are just going to die and we're just going to lose that population so Certainly some populations here are going to be very vulnerable to mm -hmm. extinction if we don't, if we don't do anything, but you know, if we, if we do start, you know, fixing things up a little bit, if we can reduce, um, climate change, at least a little bit, maybe, you know, start trying to plant some more kelp for the sea dragons and things like that. Yeah. We could, yeah, definitely hopefully slow down the, the rate of extinction, but I think we've got, we've got quite a few years left before we need to, before they're going to, you know, start going extinct, which is got cool. it. That's good. Um, yeah. So Knight tipped $60. I'm sorry, I didn't, I missed that. Oh, thank um, you. Said Queenslander, <laughs> good on you for getting out and having a fair go. That's what he said. <laughs> and then sigh with a dollar. <laughs> sigh with a dollar and 27 cents. Thank you. Um, so we're at $540. I just got a host with 18 oh. viewers. Thank you, Horseman, for the, for the host there. Um, Hi, welcome. We're talking about weedy sea dragons, but we're just closing up um, on our conservation podcast today. Uh, my 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 research assistant, my production assistant, the one that you've been emailing with, just yeah. said thank you for offending all of Australia with that accent. I didn't do an accent. <laughs> He's from Australia <laughs> as well. Connor, thank you for the thirty dollars. Awesome. I'm sorry, Saito. <laughs> I just read the dono, man. Um, so for those of you who who had questions that i did not ask on this podcast i'm sorry um where would be the best place for them to find more information if they still have questions uh you can go to our, yeah you can go to our website where it's kind of in the process of getting um updated but we're putting yeah more and more information up there every day okay um or you know there's plenty of there's like a lot of good pages it's a really um i think it's on the national geographic has some good information on them as well Cool. But if you just Google, if you Google weedy sea dragons, you'll find you'll find some good stuff. Good. So you can do command guest if you want to follow the Fish Ecology Lab on Twitter. Um, you can do command org, uh, and that'll take you to the website that that he's talking about. If you want more information, and then Saito has a bunch of links because he's done a bunch of research. So um, there you go. Okay, cool. wonderful. So we're at five hundred sixty five hundred and seventy five dollars today in donations. Oh. Uber with the five dollars. Thank you again. Um, awesome. And thank Connor, I think much. I already said thank you, but very cool. Uh, is there anything else that you that you want to talk about, or anything else you think is important to bring up uh, before we close up here? Um, no, I think um, you guys asked some really good questions. It was awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much for the donations, and 
Uh, if you're diving in Australia, just in CBDC Dragon, make sure you take some photos of it so we can For name sure. it, get it on the system. Yeah. yeah, that's such a cool concept. I love that. Um, <laughs> okay, awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Uh, and uh, I, will, good. I will send that money over to, to your PayPal once I end stream here. Awesome. Okay, cool. thank you. Thanks so much. much. Yeah, nice to meet you. No worries. You too. See ya. All right, talk to you later. Bye.